Um, this class is about animations. Um, in my mind, it's really about two things. One is about how to do iterative design um, really quickly using animations, which is something you don't typically see. You, you typically see animations as this final product. You, uh, you get to the end, you've got it all designed, and you make it really pretty. It takes forever. Um, and then you get to the client, and they kind of see, yeah, this is the building we've been going on with for the last six months. Great job. And so what this class really is, is focusing on, I think, is, is more how to use animations as a, a tool for, for informing your designs, a tool to help you iteratively look at options and then and move forward. Um, and this, this is going to focus mainly on the Revit to uh, 3ds Max workflow. I mean, there's a million ways you can get geometry, SketchUp, uh, 3ds Max itself, Rhino, et cetera. Um, but this is going to focus mainly on Revit to 3ds Max because that workflow, I feel like, I mean, at this point, everybody should be using BIM. So you, you know the, the advantages. I mean, you're doing documentation at the same time you've got stuff you can put in for visualization and simulation. Um, so these are the things we'll ideally be doing. Um, I want to do case studies, and that's how I'm going to do some of these concepts and information. Um, and and I want to do it through real projects. So you guys can see some of those in a minute. So again, what are quick animations? To me, it's two things. One is it's iterative design approach through animation. And the other is uh, cheating. Um, not quite as good as this guy. Um, but there's going to be some cheating involved. And when I say cheating, it's really, yeah, you're just getting it now, right? He's got three arms. Um, cheating meaning. There's got to be faster ways sometimes to do animations. And as, as an example, um, oops. For some reason, I cannot get the videos to load into PowerPoint. So I'm just going to pull them up one at a time. So here's Teapot A. Good old Teapot. Everybody loves Teapot and animations. So Teapot A is starting at white and is slowly over 10 seconds going to blue. Don't worry, it gets more advanced. Teapot B, and well, I should have made a different color so you know it wasn't cheating. Also, starting at white, going to blue, 10 seconds. So the question is what is the difference between Teapot A and Teapot B? The crux of it is Teapot A took 2.5 hours to render, Teapot B took a quarter of an hour. So how is that possible? Teapot A, they're both 10 seconds. Teapot B is 10 second animation. If you do 10 seconds times 30 frames, uh, you get about 300 frames. Both have 300 frames. The difference comes in the rendering time. Teapot A is rendered exclusively in max, just using a quick you know, auto key and going from white to blue. And each one took about 30 seconds, which means you get about 150 minutes worth of render time to do 300 frames. Uh, teapot B, what I did was I rendered two frames. Was the first was white, and the second was the end at blue. And then using post-processing, I collaged them. You get the exact same effect as you can tell. The difference is with post-processing, you might add 15 minutes. Um, so you've got a pretty big significant change there. And so that's what I mean by cheating is, is there a way that you can get the same end product but kind of skip the middle agony of waiting while your computer renders? So here's the setup. I want to show some standard things. These are going to apply to all the case studies. Um, so regardless, it's going to be things like how to import, export, really stuff I'm going to breeze through so I don't have to go through it every single time. Uh, and then I do want to look at these four case studies. And these case studies are based on kind of four things I think are really important when designing buildings or engineering buildings. Um, so the first one is going to be sustainability. The second one is going to be constructability, how things are put together. The third one is going to be sequencing. So this will be really good if you have a, a particularly detailed issue. You need to figure out, can you actually put it together in the order? Um, in this case, it's going to be something we're looking at that uh, it's a really tight cluster of pipes. Some things need to be removed. Some things need to be added. And then the last one is going to be diagramming and how to convey things to a client or your boss, um, whoever. And then hopefully we should have some time for uh, some Q&A. So standard setup. Again, this is going to be mostly Revit to Max. And for that reason, I said before, just because, you know, again, at this point, you should know the 
the potential of BIM is pretty incredible. You've got the idea where you can start doing documentation and at the same time progress your simulations and all the geometry you need for your visualizations. Um, that said, obviously you can bring in stuff from anywhere. You've got Revit, you've got AutoCAD, you've got SketchUp, Rhino, etc. Um, another reason I really like Revit is that you can quickly change the level of detail. So as you go through doing your documentation, if you want to cut things out for the rendering, um, you can easily do that. If you have furniture in an office building and really all you need is the curtain wall and the floor plates, you can quickly do that through the visibility graphics in Revit. Um, for materials, this is just kind of a side note. I find it much easier to go ahead and pre-apply materials as you model. Um, if you do a bunch of the modeling and geometry creation, bring it into Max, you kind of have to hunt and peck through to get everything applied. And it just seems to take a little bit longer. I find, too, you end up missing stuff that way. And inevitably, when you start rendering and you're about two hours in, you realize that something's you know, generic gray. And you kind of kick yourself and start over. Um, so as you model geometry, it's always a good idea just to go ahead and apply the material once you create the object. Um, exporting, again, there's a million different formats. Um, and there's been a ton of classes at AU over the years that have kind of argued which is the best or whatever. I think they all have their benefits. Um, and then, of course, it changes every year. So the big one this year is for 2013. Um, there's a direct import to 3ds Max from Revit. So you can live link a Revit file, which has obviously advantages um, and some disadvantages. The disadvantage being that if you are doing documentation um, and something changes in your documentation set, it'll also change in your... 3ds Max file. Um, as a personal preference, I tend to use FBX to kind of break that link. Because um, usually we're not updating the FBX unless it's the person rendering is updating the FBX. But it's still linkable instead of just importing. Um, and that brings it to link and import. There's probably some reason to import. I haven't figured it out yet. If you know of one, let me know after the class. Um, but again, if you're doing Revit and you're trying to progress, again, this is iterative. What we're looking at here is trying to progress your design through animation. So your documentation should be progressing too. So if you do link it, that means everything's always going to be syncable. Um, just some things you probably already know in terms of linking files. Um, if you are coming out of Revit and you've done a good job pre-applying materials, you can do the combined by Revit material or category. If it's a really quick um, kind of in and out job, that works pretty well. I always end up muffing something up, and so I usually do it by entity so that I can go in and individually select something in 3ds Max and change the material. Um, and when you do it, make sure on the far right there, yeah, you're right, um, the, the two checkboxes are checked. That way, if you re-link something in, it'll keep all your materials that you've changed. Um, this class is billed as an advanced class, which has given me issues before because it needs to be advanced. And then at the same time, I always get reviews that say, well, you skipped this and that. So I'm going to very, very quickly go over how to use the auto key and um, just basic animation. That way, nobody will be lost. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because this is supposed to be an advanced class. Um, so here you go, in one minute, how to do animations. Uh, basically, you have three objects, the square, the cone, the sphere. Um, down at the bottom, so I just went ahead and applied materials. Um, and at the bottom, you've got your scrub bar. Um, and as you notice, it doesn't really do anything until you set up the animation. So to start an animation, just go to hotkey and click it. And it's going to have all your objects as they are currently at frame zero, move it to whatever frame you want to move it to, and then you can start to do things to the object. So you can either move an object. Uh, another thing is you can change the object's opacity by going to its properties and then manipulating that. And then the third option is you can change the materiality color. Um, and you do that by applying material at zero and then sliding the bar up to 100 or wherever you need to go and then changing the material. And at that point, it'll all run for you. And that's the gist of it. Everybody, is, I'm assuming you're okay with that. Again, it is supposed to be advanced. I didn't want to bore people with that. 
So the case studies, and this is the meat of the, why we're here. Um, so three scientists from NASA are sitting around and they, they've got a couple billion dollars to spend down because they're running out of time. And um, one guy says, well, what should we do? Well, I think we should go to Mars, says one guy. I think we should go to Saturn, says the other guy. And the third guy says, I think we should go to the sun. And they both look at him and they're kind of like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, we should take a manned flight to the sun. How, how are you planning on doing that? It's easy, he says. We're just going to go at night. Yeah, the jokes are going to get worse. Keep with me. Um, somehow that kind of segues into sustainability. Uh, there's sun involved. Um, so this is the project. This thing took two years of my life and then made it to 95% CDs and got shelved. Um, <laughs> yeah, city government. Um, it was a public safety center, 19 stories. Uh, and so one of the big things is we've got a really nice curtain wall building and how do we shade it? Because um, we were going for lead, gold, or platinum on this building. Um, and so we started looking at heavily at the shading. And the two kind of white bars, vertical bars, were fritted glass. And then everything else had aluminum solar shades on it. And so one of the things we were looking at was how much are the solar shades going to cost? And at that time, the numbers were coming in at six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 to do these solar shades, just material-wise. Um, and so we said, well, what's going to get to this biggest bang for our buck? How can we actually justify this to the client and the public? And so one of the ways we thought about doing that was doing these animations you'll see next. And what we did was we looked at these solar shades and we said, how far apart do we need to space them? How big do they need to be? What if we incorporated, incorporated a light shelf? What if we changed them from white to black? What if we, you know, and we went through these thousands of options, which again, would typically take you a long time. I'm not really sure how you would do it. I guess you could you know, draw them in section and look at the sun angles. And so what we decided to do is to take the building, which was in Revit, um, into Max. And what you're going to see took us about three days. And this project is probably six years old at this point. Um, so the final product is a little grainy. We didn't quite have as big a TVs back then. Um, so here's a section of the building. And you can see you've got these. Uh, solar shades, and then if you look up at the top, there's a light shelf as well. Um, and again, the whole thing was kind of trying to decide what was the best and optimal spacing, best bang for the buck. Um, so we started by modeling all of our geometry. Again, we had it in Revit already, because that's what we're doing our documentation in. Um, and so for the sun shades, what we started doing is just making options and putting them on default off work sets. And that's a big thing throughout this whole presentation, is whenever you're doing this stuff, you're going to have a lot of stuff you want to test. And um, so the best way to do that is go ahead and make a default off work set in Revit. It won't affect your documentation that way. Nobody else will see it. It'll keep your file light. And when you get to the end and you've decided on the one you actually want, you can hit the delete button and get rid of all that junk. Um, so your top image there is making that default off work set. And then basically just going through and making options. Um, and I'm not going to really go into that. There's a million classes here about options in Revit. Um, but what we did was just started making options. The first thing you usually do is make a blank option, which is just kind of your standard um, nothing in it. That way it doesn't really affect your uh, documentation. You make that blank option your primary. And then you can start to add in the different options. So we had options where they were three feet apart, four feet apart, one foot deep, three feet deep, et cetera. And then you basically go and find a view you like. Um, in this case, uh, we were doing a floor plate, which you'll see next. And what we were looking at is how the sun and glare affected the floor plates on these office um, floors. And so uh, hopefully everybody's familiar, but the view cube is really powerful for people going from 3DS or from Revit into 3DS. You can right click on that view cube, which is kind of hiding there behind the, the menus. And it'll give you an option of all the views you have set up in your model. And you can set it to be a uh, section view or a, a plan or an elevation. Um, that's how. This rendering was created, basically going to that view cube, setting it up to look at a section. And it just goes ahead and slices the building off that way. And you don't have a lot of geometry. You're bringing it into max, which you then have to crop down, either using the camera or um, some kind of filtering. So that's a really powerful tool. So what we did on this one is we're looking at um, going to the view cube, right click, and then picking a floor. And we picked one of the typical floors. And when you do that, make sure you grab the whole floor. Sometimes if your floor plan is cut at four feet, it's only going to give you, you know, basically your level to four feet. So you might need to pull that section box up to grab the whole floor. Uh, go through your um, 
LOD your levels of detail and edit out whatever you don't need in visibility graphics just to keep the file light when it goes to 3DS. And then go ahead and pick the blank option and go ahead and then export at that point. And again, um, I, I guess it's 08 or 09. We didn't really have some of the nice suite workflows. Those are nice now. You can basically just one click. It remembers all these options for you. You can preset them um, based on your desires or Autodesk has some preset ones. And it'll run through and get rid of certain things that you don't maybe need, like certain cameras or sun. And then it also allows you to go ahead and choose how you want to combine entities, et cetera. Um, but again, at this point, you can export to DWG, FBX, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, and then you're going to go through and just, again, like I said, export for the base, um, the previous slide. And then go through and change the visibility graphics to option A. And again, this is where the work set comes in. Turn off all the work sets except for your solar shade work set or whatever you want to call it. And that way you'll be left with the same 3D view but just the solar shades. And you can export those one at a time. So you're just going to export option A, export option B, et cetera. So just basically repeat that over and over again. Um, unless you don't want to do it over and over again, in which case you can just tank the project. <laughs> Good old Paris. Uh, so in 3DS Max, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead and link in your, your base model. And you can go ahead and apply materials. There's a bunch of really good classes, um, especially in 09 and 010 at AU, where they just kind of brought out the, uh, the whole, uh, for the exact words they call it. But it's basically like the sun properties tool that you can do all the foot candle readings. And there's a bunch of great classes um, for AU, especially in those two years, because they're the first kind of years they came out one of which is actually given by the guy who made the tool um, in 3ds Max. But it tells you how to set up all your settings and then your diffuse properties. Because the materials on this don't necessarily matter um, visually. What you're more interested in is the diffuse and reflective qualities. Because if you're really trying to get the exact lighting, it doesn't really matter if it, the carpet looks you know, like grapes or whatever. It, it needs to actually have the correct bounce properties for all the light. Because that's what's going to give you your accurate glare and your actual accurate foot candles, et cetera. Um, and again, those, those classes that they gave did a really good job of going in depth. And there's just too much information for me to go over right now. But definitely look those up, all the sun tools for 3ds Max. Uh, so then you'll go through and link in the rest of your options. Uh, and by default, 3ds will put those options on a separate layer, which is really convenient. So you'll have all your options kind of stacked up like you see there in the screenshot. And then you can apply materials to those sunshades. At this point, you need to set up your camera. So what we did on this one was at the top view. Uh, and you can see on the far right, what's really important is um, basically making a sandwich. You want to take the camera to where it's seeing most of your uh, geometry. And then bring the, the near plane to where it cuts, um, right below the surface of your ceiling. So you're basically looking down at the floor plate um, if you were just to take the ceiling off whenever you rendered it, then the sun would obviously get through that hole. So you need to use the camera to, to keep it all nice and tight. Um, one of the other issues we ran into with Revit is you typically have things like stairs and shafts. And if you're doing it correctly, you have those, the penetrations and the shaft core set up. So you might need to go and plug some holes, especially on stair towers, because they're pretty big. Um, so yeah, you might need to go and just create a plane or um, some kind of similar geometry to plug those holes. And one of the things we started doing at the end was we just used 3D text and started setting up. And you can see there's the September. We started setting up the date and the time. This is the way to kind of see it in the rendering. Um, so these are some of the things we started getting out of the study. And so what you're seeing is up here at the top, this is the floor plate. You can start to see some of the desks. And then you can kind of see what we were really looking at was glare. We knew the foot candles were correct, because we had done the actual foot candle readings through 3DS Max. And what we were really looking at is how the glare was hitting, especially in the conference rooms and some of these uh, office bays, hitting people's computers. Um, so you can see you kind of start to have hot spots in certain areas. Um, and then here's like a long shot of the bays with all the furniture taken out. Um, one of the things we made was a timeline. And this is pretty generic and basic, but it does the job. Um, just do some 3D text and 3ds Max, make a box, and just kind of stretch it. Um, 
this works really well to basically add into the render so you can kind of time the two to go together because what we're going to look at in a minute is the progression of the sun across that floor plate. And so that time um, basically just gives you a time of day, a way to keep track. You could obviously do this with text and post-processing as well. Um, and so here's some of the raw footage we were looking at. So at the top here, I'll just pause it. You can see that floor plate looking at conference rooms, looking at uh, the sun moving across. Uh, and the bottom here, you can see a typical cube. And you can see we put in the furniture. In this case, sometimes a lot, you'll take out the furniture because it's just heavy and not needed. In this case, we kept it because we wanted to see where it hit the screens, where it hit people's chairs, where it hit people's desks. Um, and so we'd basically just sit there, my, my boss and I, and we'd sit there and just drag it forward. And we'd scrub it and scrub it back and kind of look and say, well, this guy, you know, in March, it's going to get blasted. We need to change the sunshades. And we'd pick a different option and re-render it. And we got to the point where we could do these little floor plate renderings in about two minutes, um, for like an entire day. And we started picking the, the equinoxes, picked like the really heavy days in summer or um, winter that we knew would be really critical. Um, so we were getting to the point where we were, again, churning out options maybe four, five, six every day. Um, of different sizes and lengths and such. And so the final is, again, I apologize, a little grainy. Um, but we're kind of just using it in-house, and it kind of got the job done. So we just listed all the studies we were looking at and some of the parameters. Um, and this is pretty long. It's about two minutes. I'm not going to show the whole thing. But you can kind of see what we were going for. You've got the clock on the side telling you what time of day it is. Um, you've got the bottom telling you what month it is. And then you've got the, the kind of sun running across that floor plate. And again, we just sat there in a conference room, myself, my boss, a couple designers, and we just scrub it back and forward, back and forward. And we kind of said, like, this is you know, a real hot spot. Why don't we try something different here? Um, you know, in this middle area here, there's really nobody. It's just a lobby. Who cares if it gets hot? We can take off sunshades there and save a buck. Um, this is a conference room. It may not be occupied all the time. We'll take off some there. We'll, we'll space those three feet apart instead of two feet apart. Um, so this thing, again, it, it runs for two minutes. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. Um, you obviously get the idea. But again, this is the way that we got to, at, at the end of it, we were doing, again, these things, six, seven options a day, and just trying to find what was the optimal cost to benefit ratio and, and that sort of thing. So that's sustainability. Um, constructability. So as architects and engineers, we try to strive for practicality. Uh, we usually try to have a little forethought. Doesn't always work. We're into usability for everyone. And what's really important is getting our designs to the building, or in this case, not getting our design to the building. Constructability. Uh, so the project that we did this on was a office tower, again, about 19 or 20 stories. Um, and the, the problem we ran into here was uh, this building had, was an existing building. It had a concrete with punched opening facade. And what we did is we came off that facade five feet and just dropped an entire new curtain wall, all glass. We hung it off of steel girders on the, the roof, and it just kind of hung there suspended. And we got in this odd spot where we had catwalks, because it was five feet from the existing facade to the new facade. And we had to get catwalks in there for guys to clean the windows and to do maintenance. And as you'll see in a minute, we had these uh, actuators with uh, motorized vents to help the facade um, in order to in increase the sustainability. Um, so this took us about a day. It says four, four days, four one. Uh, one day is really all it took once we started going. Um, we had the geometry already in place. And so what we were really looking at was smoke penetration. And this became an issue because we had an existing building, we had these catwalks, we had these actuators and valves, and it just got really kind of thick. So this is that assembly, a little chunk. Again, a great use of um, just Revit and then using the view cube to grab a certain piece and not having to worry about the whole model in 3ds Max. And you can see here the... Uh, that existing facade. You've got the horizontal steel, which we're tying back to. 
and then this new facade with the vented windows and the actuators. And so again, you've got a lot of little nooks and crannies, and we're trying to figure out how best to deal with the smoke penetration. Uh, and so this is a good example of where BIM might basically did prevent us from having a change order or having a real issue. You might not have caught this in CAD because this, you know, when you start looking at the eighth inch plan, it's pretty tiny. This is a good example. As we were stick building this in Revit, we caught this kind of thing. Um, so again, the same sort of steps. Go ahead and set up your export view. Use the 3D cube. Bring it into Max. Same way as before. Again, that standard setup, import, uh, whatever your file type is. Go ahead and apply materials. And then start to separate things out by layers, because this is going to help you later on as you start to do this. What we ended up doing is like an exploded axon, basically, where we could talk about the pieces. Um, we found these gaps and basically went back to the builder. Uh, it was a design build joint venture. And we said, we've got these gaps. We're going to need to cover them up. How much is it going to be? And it ended up coming back at like $700,000 just to fill in these cracks. So we we're going to have to tell somebody higher up client-wise. And so this was a, a tool for us, for the builder, and then kind of for management and the client to say, here's what the problem is. Here's what we need to do to fix it. And this is why it's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, so go ahead and take your pieces apart however you want to do it. Put them into um, layers. And then go ahead and set up your animation timeline. So you're just going to hit the auto key, like the video before, drag your pieces wherever you want to drag them out. Uh, create a camera, set up your parameters for daylighting, etc. And so this is where the cheating begins. Um, this, the, the, the previous one, the sustainability one, was not a cheating project. This is a cheating project. Um, if you were to do this in 3ds Max, you would basically start your keyframe at one. And you would take it to 100 or 200, 300, whatever you needed for a smooth video, and you'd pull it apart, and you'd put your pieces where you need them to go. Um, what you can actually do instead is just kind of render the pre and the end in little chunks, uh, and you can kind of also just render different slices and kind of fit stills into your animation. So it's kind of a hybrid animation with stills in between. And you can take the pieces into Photoshop, Photoshop them up, give them text and arrows and all kinds of little things like that. And so it's a great hybrid tool where you might end up having to render a bunch of stuff if you just done it all in 3ds Max versus chopping it up and bringing it into, we use Premiere. And you can use pretty much anything you want. If you're Mac based, you can use, um, I think they've got a couple other programs that come with it. Um, so this is that video. I need to um, preface this with that I could not show you the real video due to the nature of this project. So what you're seeing is a chunk of the video. Um, but it conveys the what we're going for. So in this case, you can see we're also cheating because we didn't render. It's in-house. It's a nice thing. You can just take it from Revit into 3ds Max. And if you turn on all the uh, transparency and the shadows within Max, I mean, those are getting really good now on the fly. So it has a nice kind of sketchy quality to it, um, which is good if you're not 100% sure about your design. Sometimes if you take a really polished rendering into a client, they say, like, well, this has obviously got to be it. They spend all this time. If you keep it sketchy, sometimes they give you a little more wee-way, and it's more of like a working session. And that's what we wanted this to be. Um, so that's kind of the raw footage there that we just took out of 3ds Max. And again, instead of spending hours rendering, we just kind of took the raw footage from 3ds Max and then combined it with these stills. Uh, and added text and then post-processed it. <coughs> so the third thing we're going to look at is um, explaining unexplainable things. With clients and sometimes your bosses, you've got a real issue of like explaining really difficult things, how things go together, how they uh, come apart. 
In this case, there's obviously no explanation of what's going on here. Um, so one of those things that we were having trouble explaining was this sequencing. And we spent a while on this. Um, it was a team of three or four of us. We were modeling the pieces and then also doing this little animation. And so what we have is a column on a, a building that's, again, about 20 stories. And inside this column, I don't know why they originally did this, but they decided it would be good to put all the um, mechanical and piping and chilled water and a bunch of different stuff all into these one column, this, this mega column, as they call them. And they kind of progress down the building. So you've got five or six of these big columns that have tons of stuff just stuck in them. And so we're doing a renovation of this building. And so we need to kind of take things apart and put things back in that are new. And so we're having a really hard time doing this. And it ended up being about 26 phases, I think, is what we finally end up with, um, and how to actually put this thing together and take it apart and put it together and take it apart. Because the building, of course, as all owners want to do, is occupy the building while it's going on. So there's a lot of taking things out by quickly putting something else in so that the services stayed on in the building. So again, we started with Revit. Um, this is a good example of a time when you might want to use a work set that's default off. Most of the stuff we wanted to see, like the, uh, the beams and the, uh, the floor, but there's a lot of stuff you don't really need in your everyday documentation, like the MISC steel and stuff. That's just going to be really heavy to have all the MISC steel in an entire building modeled. I mean, it looks great here, but you're not going to need it in most of your documentation. So do it in one or two places, and then put it on a default off work set. Uh, we, we have in-house MEP, so that was really nice. Most of the piping was already in there for us, so that was real handy. Um, but we did dress it up with some insulation and things like that. Uh, export, same as always. Pick your desired format. Uh, this one we ended up taking into FBX because we didn't really want to do the live link. And um, I find, for whatever reason, FBX works really well with smaller files. And when you get into some bigger files, I find DWG works better. And I haven't really figured out which works best with a, the, the live Revit link yet, whether I can handle big stuff or not. Um, that's kind of my personal bias, though. And so bring it into Max, and I definitely on this one did by entity when I brought it in, just because there's so many little pieces. And I wasn't really sure if MVP had put the correct materials on their stuff, and I needed to color coordinate things with legends and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, make sure if you do link it in that you do the key the materials if you decide to relink it. And then just start making your phases. So basically set up a layer for each phase and put whatever you need to on that layer. So we ended up having a total of 25, 26 phases, I believe. Um, so as you, you do this, keep it clean, and that way you can quickly change the, the visibility of these, whether they need to appear or disappear, et cetera. Start applying your materials. What really works well for this type of study? I mean, you could do realistic materials, and it would look great. Um, what also I should realize is just using like a really simple, diffuse kind of ceramic material or um, just something really basic and then just color coding everything. So it doesn't have to look realistic. It's a great option just to have everything be a nice grass green and um, Christmas red so that people really can understand the color is what's coming and what's going. Go ahead and set up your camera. Uh, if you want to do a daylight system, you can. Um, on this one, I think we just, you can kind of see it there. We just use a sky portal. Because um, when you put it on a white background and just do kind of a generic lighting, it, it tends to pop a little bit more. You can see those colors better on a white background. And then go ahead and just render out the phases. This is another um, great example of cheating, even more so than the last one. Um, what you could do in 3ds Max is have it start um, and do the, uh, the auto keying and start with your first one and have it be here and then go through and change the uh, opacity of each object, the visibility of each object one at a time and you know, progress it to frame 30 or whatever and bump up the opacity for layer one, go to frame 60, bump up the layer for two, blah, blah, blah. And that would, you know, with 26 phases, that's going to take you days to render. Um, so what we ended up doing instead was just rendering each phase as a single still. Um, in our case, we had 26 total, and they were each taking about two to three minutes because I wanted them to look real nice and crisp. Um, and I knew I wouldn't have to render the whole thing at that high resolution. So we just 
each frame we ended up doing like a little animation where we just did you know, frame one was this, frame two was this guy, frame three was this. Um, and you can bring it in and, and post-process it in, again, uh, either uh, Photoshop if you are having issues with the colors, because again, there's stills, so you don't have to worry about Photoshopping an actual animation. You can change these colors, et cetera, easily in Photoshop. Make it a PNG and stick it into your post-processor. Um, and what we did was we just added in transitions that were kind of like fade-in transitions. So each still would hold for about three seconds, fade into the next one, fade into the next one. And so you kind of get that effect that it's been rendered to where, you know, like one's gradually coming in, gradually going out. Um, and again, this is the same project as before, so I can't show you the final, um, but I got pieces you can see. Um, in post-processing, you can't really see it here because I had to take it out. Um, it's a great idea. You can make a little legend and you can color coordinate things. You can have text up at the top that says, here's you know, pipe A, it's a gas pipe. You can take it out in March and we gotta put it back in in you know, July. Here's the miscellaneous steel. It's gotta be taken out after this piece comes out. The missed steel is gonna cost $40,000. Um, it gives you a chance to basically really give a lot of information to your clients in an understandable and a digestible way. They see what's happening, why it's happening, how long it's gonna take, what the implication of them staying in the building is. Um, you know, you could say gas line has to come out, therefore a client needs to move from floor seven up to floor you know, eight and floor seven needs to be clear. It's kind of a, a mixed hybrid tool of, of uh, moving your clients and showing phasing, um, both for construction as well as for occupancy. So pretty much anything you wanna do. And again, instead of rendering the whole thing in 3DS and it taking hours or days, you can just do each still and then post-process them. So the last one is um, looking at things with clients and helping them understand some things just don't make sense. So diagramming. Um, this project was a master plan. We had five or six buildings for a client. They were redoing the whole campus. They were basically gonna gut all these existing buildings, repurpose each of the floors for, for different uses. And so you can see on the side there what we're kind of shooting for at the end is these exploded axon views that tell the clients where things are. And this took us about four days to do all the buildings and get things modeled and um, rendered. Um, go ahead and create your masses in, in Revit. Uh, you can just trace the footprints of your existing plans. Um, and basically you're gonna break it up by occupancy use or you know, whatever it is you wanna do. Um, one really cool trick you can do is you can use 3D text and basically size it to be the same size as the footprint. Um, this unfortunately for us was deemed too Art Nouveau, so we had to go back to just the block kind of footprints, but I think it's a really great way to kind of, you know, kill two birds with one stone. You're basically doing your legend and your, your uh, diagramming all at the same time. So here's a Revit view. We have the whole building footprint, just models the generic mass. Each of the floor plates are then kind of stacked up. Um, and this one, for some reason, I think because they were existing buildings, we had CAD footprints, and so we just took them into Revit and extruded up the various areas we needed to. And then we brought that into Max. So there you can see one building out of the six, all the pieces broken up. Uh, and you're gonna go ahead and apply your materials. It doesn't really matter what materials you apply at this point, just make them different enough from each other. Because again, you're gonna kinda do this Photoshop post-production trick um, and this plays out really well, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, it saved us a lot of time the way that we did it instead of just rendering it um, as a whole thing in Max. Uh, again, uh, just basic diffuse ceramic color works really well. Um, set up your animation. So I started and just basically stacked everything together on top of each other. You can kind of see. 
And the second one, here's all the pieces as they come out of Revit. Here they are stacked, and then that, that whole exterior is skin, and they kind of get stacked in there. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to start an animation, and you're going to melt down the skin so that it kind of shows the pieces of the floors, and then project up the floors so that you kind of explode a axon, axon melting skin effect. Um, and here's a little workflow video for that. So again, all your pieces stacked together. You can see in the wireframe there, everything's within that exterior skin. You're just going to grab the exterior skin, go up to the modifiers, and do a melt modifier um, after you've moved it. I put it about halfway through the animation. Just do a melt modifier and crank it up to where the whole skin kind of just melts down. Go ahead and progress and scrub forward. And at that point, you just move your masses wherever you want to put them. Make sure you leave enough room so that uh, you can get your text in there and your colors if you want to do something fancy. Not much to it. Uh, one thing you should be leery of is make sure you check your camera settings. Because if you got a nice camera set up beforehand and then you go to do the exploded axon, you might realize your camera is actually not seeing the whole thing if you explode them up too high. So it's always good to go back and check and make sure that your camera is capturing everything. So then if we scrub it forward and backwards, you see the motion. Again, the skin melting down and all those pieces exploding out. And so the way this animation worked, this ended up being about a three or four minute animation to go through each of the buildings. We also did a flyby of the whole campus. Um, what we rendered was the flyby, and then we rendered these buildings, each building basically doing the melting of the skin and then exploding up. And then for the colors, we actually went into post-processing to do the colors. So that basically allowed us to limit the amount of things we needed to render. Um, so what you go ahead and do your colors like we did before on the like slide four or whatever. And at this point, you just want to apply a, um, it's like a really generic kind of clay white material and set it to be an override. And you're going to override for one slide. So basically, go ahead and render out one still where it's exploded and it's in white. And then go ahead and render out a still where it's all the colors. And again, don't worry about spending too much time on the colors, because you're actually going to manipulate the colors in Photoshop. So when you bring it into Photoshop, you've got the, the white clay, and you put that as your base layer. And then you've got the colored pieces, and that allows you to quickly use like the wand tool or something similar and grab each of those and make it a, a layer. And you can then fill those with whatever color you want. And then if you take the, the clay and then um, set all the other layers to uh, overlay, they kind of just blend in in Photoshop. And then you can go through and just click you know, daycare on or off, fitness on or off. And what I just really say this a lot of time was my manager is just super picky about colors. And so he'd come by and he'd be like, oh, that's a really nice green. And the next day he'd come by and he's like, I really hate that green. I'm like, well, that's the exact same green we had yesterday. Well, it's awful now. Um, so if we had done these as full renderings in Max, that would have been like another day of just re-rendering because he didn't like the color. Um, whereas in Photoshop, it's literally, what, you know, five, six seconds to go and fill it up with a new color. And again, you just blend all those pieces together. Each um, occupancy is a, its own uh, layer with text and anything else fancy you want to put on there, sizes, square footage, etc. Overlay. Uh, this works really well. So we, you'll see in the final video, we did it for the whole campus as well. And it works great if you want to look at things like the parking lots. Um, I don't know if I had that video here, but we went through as well and we highlighted the roads. Because once you render it out, you can quickly start to use something like the lasso tool and grab things. You can grab all the roads and make them brown. You can grab all the parking lots and say they're all blue and show how many you've currently got. Um, 
you can grab the existing buildings and make them all purple. It, you know, it's obviously anything you want to do. And it's all really quick because it's in Photoshop. The things need to change. It's really just a, a lasso and a, a fill tool away. Uh, create a legend. And then bring it all into your final post-processing. And again, what you're going to do here is basically this collage. It's that hybrid effect again. We have some things that are full-on animations, like a rotating um, fly around of the campus. And then you've got the exploded axons coming up. And then you've got these stills, which are using transitions to just kind of march along. And you can change those quickly if the text needs to change or the color needs to change. Um, and then you can apply titles, text, music. Again, this was a pretty big production. We got paid um, just to do this animation for the client. And so it ended up being about three or four minutes long to show all these buildings, to show all the parking lots, and you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we put some really just cheesy text. I'm not sure why, but we did. Uh, yeah, let, let me, we're almost finished, and then we can take all the questions. So again, just standard fly around, nothing fancy. The amended pieces are the buildings flying apart and then the parts where it changes to stills. Again, you're saving however many frames here per thing. You guys get the jest, right? It goes on for a while. You gotta have your name at the end. So, um, that's actually it. It's pretty quick. I think we're early, so I'm happy to take questions if you guys have. Yeah. Right. So the question was, on the sequencing, how did we know what to, to do architecturally and construction-wise? That project was a design-build collaboration project. So we, we, had a, we had actual guys in-house helping us doing some of the modeling, and they were there on a day-to-day -day basis. So we were able to really sit down and like work through it, pen and paper first, and then put it all on the computer. Yeah. Right. So the question was, on the estimated times for production, was it man hour based, or what, what did that really mean? Um, it's mainly just me. I don't really have any amazing setup. We don't really even have a render farm. So everything you were seeing there was basically me for however many days it said. I've got an octa-core. Um, it's about five years old. It's got like a 2.0. So it's not really flying or anything. So again, anywhere we can cut corners by just doing the stills, we, we try and do that. Yeah. 
Uh, everything is done in Adobe Premiere. It's a little bit pricey, but usually you only have to buy one license because it's rare that everybody in the office is going to need that kind of thing. Um, so. Premiere Element? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. I mean, you can even use Windows Movie Maker if you want. I mean, it has transitions, and I just find Premiere worth, the, I don't know, whatever it is, 600 bucks so we can crop and cut in music and cut out and stuff like that. Oh, really? Nice. Okay, excellent. Right. Yeah, so the question was, have we looked at Google, SketchUp, and things like that to do animations? And yeah, we have. I think on one of these, um, like that constructability one, the very first slide actually is from SketchUp. We were doing some of the more smaller pieces in SketchUp. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can do the animations of, yeah, in SketchUp. And, right. Hmm. No, I've not tried that. Hmm. No, I've not tried that. Usually, like for SketchUp and, and Google Earth, we'll just bring in like Topo or, um, yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys.